Welcome to the Friends with Money podcast, brought to you by Money Magazine, creating financial freedom for Australians since 1999. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Friends with Money podcast. My name is Tom Watson, a senior journalist here at Money Magazine, and it's great to be with you once again. As 2022 winds up, plenty of people will be making some time over the summer break to take stock of their financial position and start planning for the new year ahead. I know I'm one of them. Um, Perhaps you may be even thinking about whether 2023 is the year to buy an investment property. So if that sounds like you, then good news, because today we are talking all about property investing, and we're going to zoom in on a few areas around the country that may prove particularly attractive to budding investors. And to dig into all of that, I'm pleased to say that I'm joined by Arjun Paliwal, who is not only the director and head of research at buyer's agency Investigate, but also a co-host of the Property Nerds podcast. Arjun, it's a uh, it's a pleasure to finally have you on the pod after so long talking about it. Tom, appreciate the intro, the kind words, and great to be on as well, discuss all things property. Well, I'll let you do most of the uh, discussing today, mate, because you are the expert and uh, we do have a fair bit to get through. So just to start us off and get the ball rolling, could you help us set the scene by, I guess, talking to us broadly about how the property market has fared throughout 2022 and I guess what have been the big talking points of the year so far? Great question to start with. So the property market 2022 has been an interesting one because firstly, what we've seen is we've seen a big transition in the growth rates from last year to this year. Now, last year we saw some of, if not one of the most high growth periods in our Mm. lifetime taking back to 2000 to 2005 would have been the last time many would have seen conditions to a similar level. However, starting from about January, February this year, that flatlined for many locations, mainly in our two biggest markets, and started to change even further uh, for some surrounding markets. So I would say the emergence now is we have a clear three-speed market, which is you know, our two biggest cities have been declining a bit further than some others. Then we've got some of our rest of our cities flattening out. And then when it comes to a few smaller pockets, we're actually still seeing some growth occur. Mm. So it's not the one speed, one direction everywhere. It's definitely a change in terms of the direction. And that's the uh, that's the major caveat that an, I always uh, always forget about and always need to add with the property market is that it's not just one market, is it? There are many different markets around Australia. And as you pointed out, the uh, the focus shouldn't always be on Sydney and uh, to a lesser degree, Melbourne as well. Um, but I, gu- I guess briefly as well, following on from that, um, how do you see 2023 shaping up uh, in comparison? This is, um, t- 2023 is where... It could start in one way, but end in the other. And that's our early predictions from what we're seeing. So firstly, from a few early indicators in some of our more auction heavy cities, we are clearly seeing some trends start to flatten out. So to give you some context, Sydney, Melbourne, the likes, and I mentioned these a couple of times because of the statistical weighting Mm. they have, just how largely populated they are. But when it comes to those two cities, We have seen listing levels start to trend down, and this is an early sign that, hey, maybe the spring and, you know, sunnier season isn't as springy or jumpy with lots of people excited to put properties on the market. So that listing down in some of these, you know, regions are a starting point as to people kind of backtracking, maybe not feeling as confident. Secondly, we are seeing the auction clearance rates move from the absolute bottom, say the 50s back into that 60s and even touch close to 70%. Now, history has suggested that that sort of 63 to 65% mark is where the balanced or long-term averages of balanced markets are. And we've crossed that in recent times, which means that we might be finding our sweet spot between the buyers and sellers where before there used to be a disconnect in a very different region, which is why growth was happening. So I think that's kind of the main thing to look at from the end of the year trend so far. But should interest rates continue to rise, which signs suggest they will a little bit longer, then that earlier part of the new year, just because it's so connected with lending, and for those perhaps new to this, the lending 
works in a way where banks consider borrowing capacity as a certain percentage above interest mm. rates. So the hovering rate right now is around that 3% mark. So right now, whilst you might see banks assessing rates between 4 5 and in some case 6% in terms of the actual rates people are paying, in terms of the actual assessment that's going on, you're being assessed at 8%, if not more. Now, you know, one would typically say no way that anyone could be paying 8% in reality, uh, or in fact, the same way we were saying we didn't think we'd be paying, you know, the money that people are paying Too today. Sure. So the the truth is though, 8% is still very much on the, the crazier things if everyone is paying that, considering the debt levels that are just there. So what that means is that if this rate increase continues to go up, credit availability continues to be harder for many people. And what we've seen so far, 25 to 30% borrowing re- capacity reductions is actually a faster reduction than the prices are moving. Mm. And that's resulting in ABS finance data showing that actual finance and the take up of finance is also free falling quite a lot. Now, very rarely do people buy houses with cash. Uh, it does come up from time to time, but finance is a big key part of it. So the start of the year could look like some of our more pricier markets, some of the ones where your borrowing capacities hurting at a higher multiple are going to remain, you know, a little bit difficult to have the amount of buyers that they once did simply due to these changes in assessment rates versus where the prices are. However, what we have noticed is that we're of the belief that we feel interest rates are going to be overshot. And the same way, you know, in one direction, we probably cut too low in, you know, hindsight looking at the last couple of years is the same way we feel that RBA is probably increasing Mm. too much. And so this is really driven by analysis of repayments versus incomes across many areas from mortgages. Also, rental payments versus incomes, they're a little bit more balanced, much more balanced in comparison to mortgage repayments. And not many areas are coming up as undervalued based on the mortgage repayments at that 5.5 to 6.5% which does mean that you know people can't keep seeing house price growth to certain levels at some of our pricier ends of the market and some of those markets where those job markets may not be, not, not be as strong. So if we do start to see an overshoot in the actual pricing of of you know interest rates and money that's out there and the borrowing capacity continues to get stung then that start of the year may not be as rosy for many markets in terms of the growth rates. But the second half of the year, if we do start to see the overshooting recognized and maybe pulling back, well, then you've got two things positively going for Australia. Number one is many of our housing markets are not full of people, contrary to what people think, needing Mm. to sell. That's some very important point. Our delinquency rates still remain extremely low. And we can see in a time where repayments have shot up, where many people might be thinking that, oh no, here comes all the distressed sales we have still seen listings actually be at extremely low levels and in many cities actually decline. And so this is where when we do see some return of borrowing capacity, when we do see some overshoot of interest rates recognized and turn around, when we do see some confidence return to the marketplace, it's going to look like you know a whole bunch of people have their head in the sand. They're going to look up and realize there's not a lot of supply around many cities in Australia, which will cause another stronger run in prices should the borrowing capacities allow them to. Interesting. Uh, thank you for giving us such a thorough um, setting of the scene there. Um, how about we get into some kind of specific locations that uh, that you've probably got on a big list somewhere there, Arjun, <laughs> um, that investors might want to look at next year and, and, and I guess why as well. So where would you like to start? Perfect. Well, I've got a few locations and we'll start off with Queensland. Now, Queensland has a few cities that are popping up on our radar. Now, how did this radar come about? Well, we followed the same you know, summarized version of what I just mentioned, which is there are many areas in which supply is extremely mm. low. And so if we're hoping for certain areas to start to see a strengthen even quicker than any other locations in their trends, it means that when demand confidence starts to return on finance and you know, people sentiment, then it's areas that are undersupplied 
that are going to see the quickest recovery or the quickest strengthening in trends. Now, strengthening in trends are those areas that are still growing because there are actually many regions and some of the regions here I'm going to shout out. Now, we created a score and it's called the SSS, Supply Shortage Score. And this scoring is you know, using machine learning, uh, a lot of back testing in place. Uh, and we're now looking at you know, six core data points and they are future supply, established supply, price pressure, rental pressure, housing availability, and people mm. movement. Now, this is looking at essentially in simple terms, construction, listings for sale, stock on market, days on market, vendor discounting, rental vacancy, and population changes. So for everyone looking at all the jargon, it essentially means there's not a lot of properties for rent or not a lot of properties for sale equals a high <laughs> score. And the higher it is to five makes it some of the strongest locations in terms of undersupply. Okay. Now in Queensland, there's a fair few locations coming up. So to give you a couple of examples, a lot of them actually in the regions, Toowoomba. Toowoomba scored 4.3 out of five in this metric. And we actually looked at over 300 statistical area three, so SA3 regions. Toowoomba's reason for strength here is that its established supply is extremely low. Uh, depending on which data sets we're using, we can see listing levels between 30 and 42% below pre-COVID. So if you took houses for sale back in Feb 2020, just the month before pandemic, versus houses for sale now, there is a substantial reduction. And the same thing goes on with rental vacancy, which is remaining extremely low, all whilst price growth has actually still been growing even after seven consecutive still. interest rate rises. So it just shows that there's still markets across the country moving. Another couple of locations that I can throw at you, one is the city of Rockhampton. So that's been interesting. Uh, we've been seeing trends and agents calling multi-offer scenarios every single weekend over the last few months, again, after seven consecutive interest rate rises. And I'm noticing a bit of a trend across these areas. They have A, not had absolute mind-boggling growth over the last 10 years. So they've kind of either been below their 30-year averages over the last 10 years, or they've caught up to their sort of 30 year averages over mm. the 10 years, but they have not absolutely outperformed. Now to give some people some context, last 30 year of city averages have been between seven and 8% per annum. Whereas many parts of Sydney have actually averaged 14%, 12%, and the worst being 10 to 11% per annum over the last 10 years. So if we believe, you know, that all things equal that seven to 8%, I mean, you need to have somewhat of a return to averages, well, those locations have definitely outperformed in recent 10 years, whereas these locations that are quite resilient have a combination of low established supply, low rental supply, low recent or average recent 10-year performance, and a level of affordability. So that seems to be a common trend we're seeing across the country, Rockhampton, Cairns, Bundaberg, Toowoomba with some Queensland standouts. Townsville to some extent as Interesting. well. Interesting. So a lot of these kind of coastal, regional Queensland's towns and I guess cities. Yeah, that's an interesting pickup. Yeah, it's true actually. There's a couple of coastal uh, outside of the Toowoomba being mm. the inland. Uh, but yeah, we've got many other inland regions. If we take a trip across the borders, we go over to South Australia, Barossa Valley scored a 4.2 out of 5 on our metrics and Albury Wodonga scored a 4.4 out of 5 and Wagga Wagga 4.3. So it's clear that We've got a few locations here that have this common trend of affordability, undersupply for sale, undersupply for rental, and did not have an absolute game-changing 10 years, except for maybe the likes of Albury Wodonga. Mm, that's so interesting. I mean, and the Barossa sounds like a wonderful place to uh, to live and rent. So, uh, I mean, I wouldn't mind living there <laughs> personally. <laughs> I think uh, definitely the wines are an attractor for sure. And when you've got house prices for great looking homes between four hundred and six hundred thousand, not many people can say no to wow. that. Wow. Okay. So relatively affordable then as well. Definitely. And that's a clear trend we're seeing across the very resilient locations, like I've mentioned, across Australia, even after seven interest rate rises. And how about any other any other areas outside of uh, Queensland and uh, and South Australia and uh, I guess New South Wales Victoria border with uh, Aubrey Wodonga? 
Yeah, so there, there was uh, the region of SA that we mentioned, but if you actually head down in SA to the capital cities, Adelaide has a few sub-regions as well. Mm. In the southern sub-regions of Adelaide, we've got the Onkaparinga Council, and we've also got uh, the Prospect Walkerville SA3 region. Um, but if you go to a few other regions, I can even find sub-regions of our major city. So we had the region of Penrith and Camden in Sydney, and even Mornington Peninsula in the you know further extended regions of Melbourne. These scored between 4 and 4.7 out of five in our uh, supply shortage score. Mm. And the big thing we're seeing here is uh, a very healthy, you know, level of undersupply in terms of established listings, high amounts of people movement, uh, low stock on market, and again, very low vacancy rates, sub 1% seem to be a very common trend across many parts of Australia. In fact, we haven't seen vacancy rates as low as we're seeing now, going back to April of 2006. Jeez. That's incredible, and um, and they've kind of stayed quite um, quite low for quite some time now, haven't they? Definitely. Before I let you go, you are a man with a fair bit of experience in this domain. So, do you have any tips, or even just one tip, that you'd be able to share with anyone who you know might be thinking about buying an investment property or expanding their uh, existing portfolio? Yeah. So, I would say twenty twenty three is going to be a very confusing year for many. And as a result, it's important to put the year into context of your investing goals and investing mm. life. Now, if your goal is driven around in 20 years, I'd like to be in, or by the time of this age, or come retirement, we'd like to have this, it's very unlikely that you're investing for the next one to three years. You're investing probably for a 10, 15, 20, or even 30 year period, depending on when you're getting started or what you're looking to expand upon. Now, from the, the history, 30, 40, 50 years, you stretch this curve out, six to eight, seven to eight percent per annum seems to be the most common piece of capital growth rates on average over that time. Whether this was a small city, a large city, a city that you're aware of, your backyard, most regions, if not all, have at least had over 5% per annum. So, this is where you need to look at property investing from a long-term perspective and actually look at it that when you are investing, your buying window, the longer you make it, so if you're planning to buy over the next 10 years, the longer you make that buying window, the less time you have a, a value of assets compounding. So my biggest tip is just get out there, make it happen, think about your long-term goals because the confusion that we're in is not going to last for a long time especially as when many people wake up and start to realize that Australia's rental supply hasn't been this low, Australia's job markets are still extremely strong, although there is that engineering of trying to slow things down from lots of migration that will come in as well as you know, lots of uh, you know, cash rate mm. hikes. However, nonetheless, through all these different periods, Australia has had that 7 to 8% over the long term. And I think uh, you know, it's, it's fair to say that the resilience is quite, quite there. And, and when you're thinking of your long-term goals, this is the way that you need to think and not make your buying journey too long. Because if you do, you've got less time for compounding. That's, um, that's a wonderful piece of advice. And I think that's a really lovely place to, uh, to leave things for today as well. So Arjun, thank you so much for joining us and uh, really looking forward to uh, chatting with you next time as well. Thank you, my friend. Looking forward to next time and hopefully a bit of a recap on how these locations went a couple of years down if the track. If you're game for it, we'll have you back on, mate. We can see how you did. Done. <laughs> Don't forget that if you enjoy listening to Friends With Money, we'd love you to share or, or recommend it to your own friends and family. Not only does that help us out, but they uh, might like it as much as you do. You can also leave a glowing review on iTunes or the Apple Podcasts app. And while you're there, hit the subscribe button to make sure that you don't miss out on our future episodes. We'd also love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or even story ideas. So to send something our way, make sure you use our dedicated email, which is podcast at moneymag.com.au. And last of all, you can keep up to date with all the latest financial news and views on our website by heading over to moneymag.com.au. That's it for this episode of the Friends of Money podcast, though, but we will be back in your feeds next week. I'm Tom Watson. Bye for now. 
Thanks for listening to the Friends with Money podcast. For credible, independent and easy to understand financial commentary, visit moneymag.com.au. Please remember that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are general in nature and further independent advice and research based on your personal circumstances should be sought before making an investment decision.